Good morning. My name is Mark Rowe. I'm a research scientist here at the NOAA Great Lakes Environmental Research Lab, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the Great Lakes Seminar Series today. Dr. Annika Kaczynski is a water quality modeler at the National Institute for Water and Atmospheric Research in Christchurch, New Zealand. Dr. Kaczynski uses field, laboratory, and modeling approaches to inform river and lake management of nuisance algal growth. She currently leads a team in developing and testing remote sensing methods to monitor stream, paraphyte, and cover, and biomass in New Zealand rivers and streams. Dr. Kaczynski earned her PhD in environmental engineering at Michigan Technological University in Houghton, Michigan. Her research focused on mechanistic modeling of nuisance benthic algae, specifically Cladophora, in the Great Lakes. Dr. Kaczynski's research on improvement of the Great Lakes Cladophora model is timely. As many of you know, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement requires the U.S. and Canada to specify nutrient loading targets and nutrient concentrations to meet ecosystem objectives for the Great Lakes, including freedom from nuisance algae. In 2016, updated nutrient loading targets were set for Lake Erie under the Water Quality Agreement, but the committee felt that the Cladophora models were available at the time were not of sufficient quality to make a recommendation with respect to management of Cladophora. In the meantime, US EPA is currently funding a monitoring program led by USGS to generate data that could be used to develop improved models. Thus, Dr. Kaczynski's research helps to meet a need for improved models to support put off our management in the Great Lakes. So without further delay, I'll turn it over to Annika. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction, and thank you, everyone, for making time in your morning to come. Um, to listen to me talk about the Great Lakes Cladophora model version 3. And I'm sure a lot of you might think, oh my goodness, she came from New Zealand to come and give this seminar. Well, um, <laughs> yes and no, I'm combining this with um, several visits here, but yes, I've got a line of work in New Zealand and a line of work in the Great Lakes that I'm keeping going. And believe it or not, there are a lot of issues that overlap. We've got a lot of nuisance growth um, plaguing New Zealand rivers, and that's one of the reasons they hired me, to look at um, modeling nuisance growth there in the rivers. So that said, with further, without further ado, I'm going to step right into this. Um, now bear with me. It'll be a little bit more technical than some of the other talks I would normally give, but I figure this is um, a good audience. So we'll look more under the hood here for this model. I will start with um, acknowledging um, some my collaborators here, so my former PhD advisor, um, Dr. Marty Auer, has been um, integral with in, in making this happen. Um, a One of his former master students, Ankita Bakshi, helped a lot, and then um, Steve Chapra um, was also involved in this work. Um, the town of Ajax funded part of this work, um, as well as PhD fellowships um, at Michigan Tech that I received. And then, of course, I have to um, thank my current employer, Niwa, for allowing me to um, pursue some of this through, through my postdoc work there recently. All right, so, let's see. How do I advance a slide? <laughs> I'm gonna have to click, I suppose. All right, it's a little bit of an overview. This works now. I'll start with a little bit of background information for those who don't know a whole lot about Cladophora yet. Um, then I want to briefly discuss the Cladophora resurgence that we've been seeing in the past 10 years or so, 20 years or so. Um, then a little bit of background on mechanistic models for Cladophora. I'll start with um, emphasizing the logistic growth model that's been used widely. Then discuss the Great Lakes Cladophora model and different versions of it the model framework that it's built on, the light and temperature response curves that have been used in the model, and then get into this segmented canopy approach that we um, implemented in version three. So the canopy effect or a self-shading effect. I'll present a few results um, and summarize my work at the end. All right, so what is Clodophora? I think we're all familiar with it, but um, it's a filamentous green alga considered native in the Great Lakes. So it forms, um, it's, it's naturally present here, but not in huge amounts um, normally. Um, growth requirements, it requires hard substrate, um, nutrients, light, of course. It's the optimal temperature range um, has been between 13 and 17 degrees. Um, phosphorus is the limiting nutrient in the Great Lakes. 
um, and the growth season is from April to September with maximum uh, biomass usually occurring in July. Um, now we've seen Clodophora in the Great Lakes for decades. Um, it dates back to the mid 1800s here that we see a monk on Putten Bay Island in Lake Erie meditating over washed up Clodophora. And we can go to Lake Erie, uh, Lake Erie and look at the 1930s and the 1950s and poke at some algae on the beach. We can go to Lake Michigan in the 60s and prepare our gas masks if we want to spend a day at the beach and avoid the smells. And we can look at Lake Erie in the early 2000s and Lake Michigan in the 2000s and Lake Ontario just five years ago. So it's been around. Now, we've had problems in the past and then there was sort of a dark age of Clodophora and we, we didn't see a whole lot of nuisance um, Clodophora washing up on beaches. In the 90s, there were hardly any publications on this topic, so it almost seemed like it wasn't a problem anymore. But then come the early 2000s, we saw it washing up on the, our beaches again. So what happened here? Um, has there really been a Clodophora resurgence, or is it more of a thing in our minds? Did we just not notice it before? So um, I looked at this as part of my PhD work and um, looked at beach um, data to see if if we can quantify this resurgence, if it's really a thing or just in our minds. So I looked at the percent beach closures due to algae, so the number of beach closure days due to algae per total number of beach days on Lake Ontario, on Ontario Beach in Rochester, which had the most comprehensive data set available. And I looked at the number or that percentage before the invasion of dry synods, the zebra and quagga mussels, which I'm pretty sure everybody's familiar with, and after that invasion and the establishment of those mussels. And I found that there was a significant difference in the um, number of beach closures due to algae. So it does seem like this resurgence is real. So what caused this Clodophora resurgence? Um, that was the main motivation for this paper we published in 2016. Um, where we took a closer look. So conditions have changed over the years, and I'm replotting data that have been shown over and over um, that were published by um, Dove and Chapra. So total phosphorus levels, these are spring total phosphorus concentrations in offshore Lake Ontario, and they've clearly come down over the years. So I'm looking at three distinct periods here, the pre-phosphorus management period, so before we had any limits on point sources um, discharging into the lake. Then a post-P management period when we started implementing limits on wastewater treatment plant effluents um, specifically. Um, and we see that phosphorus levels in the offshore definitely came down in response to that. And then I'm looking at this post dry synod period. So after or once the mussels were established in the lake. And you know the phosphorus levels are clearly leveling off here. Um, but at the same time, as we've got decreasing total phosphorus levels in the offshore, um, the mean bottom detection depth limit, which is a mouthful that really just represents um, water clarity in this case, it's a measure of how deep satellites can see into the lake, um, and that, that measure has really gone up. So what I want you to take away from this is that over time, the mean open lake total phosphorus concentrations have decreased. But at the same time, the mean bottom detection depth limit, an indicator for water clarity, has increased. So conditions have changed over time. Now, what does this mean for Clodophora? Um, keep this in mind. Nutrients or total phosphorus has come down while light has increased. So we did a modeling analysis to compare what's happened in these different periods and found that the net rate of photosynthesis has actually decreased while at the same time, the depth of colonization for Clodophora has increased. So those arrows are supposed to show you that, you know, that distribution is, is very different now. So those are model results. Um, we took an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle, down to the lake at Ajax, the northern shore of Lake Ontario, and um, had a look across the transect. And we found that, sure enough, there's lots of biomass at two and a half, five, and 10 meters start to taper off at 15 and 20 meters. There's not a whole lot going on at 25 meters, and we couldn't find any Clodophora at 30 meters. So that confirms our model results here that Clodophora is present at those depths now. So that means that the net or the net production is, can be calculated as the net aerial production of Clodophora 
um, multiplied by the area of colonization. So we've seen that the rates of photosynthesis have come down over the years, so that term has come down, but we're still seeing Clodophora on the beach. So what's happening with area? Um, I threw this slide in this morning because I looked at a paper recently, I, I don't know, I remembered it and thought, wasn't there something? So I want to take a quick look um, and go back in time a little bit to 1991 and um, highlight something, a finding by Lorenz and colleagues. So they looked at minimum light requirements for substrate colonization by Clodophora glomerata. So it's not the first time that we're thinking about light in Clodophora. And um, these guys found, these guys looked at, you know, the, the minimum amount of light required for Clodophora to grow and came up with 29 micro Einsteins per meter per second per meter squared per second. Um, and at the end of their paper, they state that if in the future the turbidity of the basin, they were looking at like Erie, decreases in response to decreased nutrient loadings and or biological processes, and soluble reactive phosphorus levels remain high, we won't focus so much on 15 micrograms per liter here, but if they remain high enough, the abundance of Clodophora may increase due to an expanded area available for colonization. I thought, wow. This was a while ago. Someone had a hunch that something might happen if light conditions change. Well, we took a look um, at that area of colonization and working with um, Colin Brooks and Amanda Grimm at MTRI, um, we calculated the colonizable area um, off the shore of uh, Toronto and Ajax here and found that going from 1975 to 1983 to 2011, we see some changes. There aren't that there isn't that much change between um, the Clodophora habitat in 1975 and 1983. There's a little bit, but it's not drastic. But if you go from the 80s to 2011, a whole lot more area becomes visible for the satellite and also for the algae in terms of light. Now, the, the tan color here represents sand, so the substrate isn't ideal for Clodophora. But um, regardless, a whole lot more habitat is opened up this way. So we see that while the net aerial production has decreased recently, the colonizable area has increased and the production potential along with that has increased as well. So keeping in mind what Lorenz and colleagues warned us about, um, there may be an increase in Clodophora due to an expanded area available for colonization. We have found exactly that. Changes in light conditions have now opened up a whole lot more real estate for these algae to, to colonize over, and if you mow that lawn over that whole area and deposit all of that on the beach, then conditions are looking pretty bad. So, um, so what are we doing about this Clodophora resurgence? We know it's happening. Um, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement of 2012 recognizes that we've got to focus on nearshore areas, whereas previous versions were looking at um, the whole lake and offshore levels, nutrient levels a lot more, but now we've got to distinguish between, well, or focus on both the near shore and the off offshore. And um, the agreement clearly states that we have to maintain the levels of algal biomass below the level constituting a nuisance condition. This is really great, but also really tricky because it's so vague. What does that mean, a nuisance, um, a, a level that's acceptable and not a nuisance condition. I think we can all agree that this is a nuisance condition, but how do we quantify this? Is it amounts of biomass on the beach? Is it biomass in the water? Um, so that's tricky. So what? how do we do this? Well, we use models, right? How do we predict Clodophora's response to environmental conditions? We try to model it. So the first um, Clodophora model um, came about in the early 1980s and was conceived by uh, Marty Auer and colleagues and published in a series of seven papers in the journal of Great Lakes Research. And um, this was the first mechanistic model taking into account light, temperature, and nutrient concentrations. And then in the early 2000s, um, a group in Canada, Scott Higgins, Sarah Malkin, um, picked this up and um, extended it to work for different depths. So the original model only considered one depth in Lake Huron, and um, this, this new version, the Clodophora growth model, the Canadian version, um, took it a little bit further and worked it a bit with the sloughing mechanism, um, so enhanced it a bit. And then the Great Lakes Clodophora model version 2, published by um, Tomlinson and colleagues, um, 
Dr. Auer's group um, came out and created a, a nice user interface for this model and also extended it to cover different depths. So it became um, nicely, um, it had a nice user interface. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about the framework of these models. So this is where we're getting a little bit technical and equation heavy. I hope I won't put anyone to sleep. I'll do my best here. But I, I really want to go and look under the hood here a little bit. So all of these models are based on um, a differential equation that describes the rate of change in biomass density. So accumulation of biomass is the difference in growth, in growth terms and loss terms. If we, um, ex if we express that as a dif differential equation, we have a growth rate mu, a respiration rate r, and a sloughing rate that mediate that growth. Um, alongside this um, state equation, we also keep track of stored phosphorus. So that's the amount of phosphorus that's stored inside of the algae. And that um, is calculated as an uptake rate of phosphorus um, minus a respiration rate and sloughing rate that affect the stored um, content. So today, um, for this third version, um, we're, I'm going to focus on the growth and respiration terms here. Um, so, the, so each of these terms depends on a number of things, and looking at the growth growth rate, um, it's calculated as an absolute ideal maximum growth rate that's attenuated by, by a light and temperature coefficient. So, so these are all coefficients ranging between zero and one. So here's an attenuation coefficient depending on light and temperature. Here's one that depends on stored phosphorus, so if the algae are um, it's droop mechanics here. I won't go into this, but it's mediated by how full the algae are inside. If they're already full of phosphorus, they're not going to take up phosphorus as quickly, um, but, but there's a lot of growth potential. If they're starving, they're, the uptake rates will increase, but they can't grow as fast. Um, and then there's this F of X, F of maximum biomass um, term that's a carrying capacity. And this is really interesting. Um, the carrying capacity term. I'll get into that more. Now, the I'm going to pull out the respiration rate as well. So that's a respiration um, is usually modeled as a combination of basal respiration. So that's um, the amount of respiration that occurs at any point in time, in the dark, in the light. It's algae respire just like we respire asleep or not. Um, and then there's a light enhanced respiration term. So respiration picks up um, depending on light and temperature conditions as well. So I'm, I'm looking at both of these because I'm interested in light um, and also this carrying capacity term today. So, um, right, carrying capacity. Um, traditionally, carrying capacity um, has been uh, modeled using the logistic growth model. So we can go with simple exponential growth that goes up into oblivion and to bring that down to something realistic and stop it from shooting up into oblivion, we can introduce um, this uh, carrying capacity term um, in front of X that will, will push the curve down um, depending on what X max is. So here I'm presenting three different options for three different maximum biomass levels that this alga or this uh, species could um, experience. And you can see the result of this model heavily depends on what X max is. So you could calibrate your model to a maximum biomass density if you have a lot of data, possibly, um, but it would be very site-specific. So take home here is the model is very sensitive to this X max term. So we wanted to see if we can model carrying capacity or this, at what point do we reach a maximum biomass in a more mechanistic way without having to impose a maximum biomass term. So we looked at um, modeling this via self-shading. And this, we're not the first to think of this. I want to acknowledge that um, Dr. Scott Higgins um, from Canada first came up with this and um, tried this in his model, the Clodophora growth model, model, but it hasn't been widely applied. So um, we took this concept and developed our own version of it. And the concept here is that we're attenuating light through the water column, which we've always done. So incident light is attenuated and less light is available at the top of the algal mat. 
And then we attenuate it again using a different light extinction coefficient, an extinction coefficient through the mat, um, and, and slice that mat into multiple layers um, to determine what the growth rate in each of these layers is. Um, because at the surface, the cells should experience or should receive more light than the cells at the bottom of the, of the mat. And the more biomass we have, the darker it gets at the bottom, which will ultimately suppress growth itself in a mechanistic way. So mu net here is the, the net growth rate. The net growth rate is going to be higher in the top cells and lower or negative even. We've got net, net respiration in the bottom cells. So we're going from a lumped system, traditionally, that sees this whole mat as just one layer, um, to a segmented system. Um, and here's the equation that goes, goes with what I just um, explained. So we've got um, I naught incident light at the surface here, or at the water surface way up here. <laughs> and then we attenuate that through the water column with a light extinction coefficient through the water. And then we attenuate it again um, through the algal mat. So Z mat is the depth of the mat, and K alg is the attenuation coefficient or light extinction coefficient through the mat. So um, it's important to get that factor, that F of I T factor that's in both the growth, growth rate and the respiration rate equation correct um, if we want to simulate what's happening in each of these layers. So let's go back and look at some um, light and temperature response surfaces. So in the first version of the Clodophora model, um, that attenuation came was was created from a series of experiments that Graham and et al. conducted in the early eight or actually late 70s, um, published in the early 80s. And what they did was um, they grouped Clodophora at different light and temperature conditions. So a whole matrix of a lot of experience, experiments um, across a gradient of light conditions and temperature conditions. So you probably can't read this very well, but um, on the on the y-axis here, we've got growth, mu, so per day, the growth rate as a function of um, temperature on the x-axis. And each of these plots is for a specific light. That's what's in the box. Um, the white part of the graph represents gross growth. The black part of the graph is the respiration rate that was measured, and the hatched parts are the difference in those two, so the net growth rate. So um, this is just an example of some of those plots. So he had a whole lot of those plots and came up with um, these um, light temperature response curves, slices, and then um, added them up more or less and fitted um, a surface, polynomials, to describe the growth rate, the net photosynthesis, which from which you can get a growth rate, and the respiration rate as functions of light and temperature. So you came up with these polynomials that were fitted to those data. Now that worked reasonably well, um, but Tomlinson and colleagues um, adjusted those equations in the second version of the model because some of the results from the experiments were deemed outliers. So sometimes you had extremely high and extremely low rates that were all included in um, determining these coefficients here. You see it's a fairly comp or fairly high level um, polynomial. We've got 15 coefficients in each of these um, surfaces. Now Tomlinson's only has um, up to 13 in each of these and um, deemed that an improved surface. So I was going to use these equations, um, but ran into trouble and I don't have a good slide showing how I ran into trouble, but I'll try and show it on here. So these surfaces work right in the middle of, of the surface. Um, so when light conditions are okay to mediocre. But when light conditions become really poor, the surface kind of drops off. And in the second version of this Clodophora model, there's a hardwired um, line that says there's just no growth beyond if you've got less than 35 microeinsteins per meter squared per second. So it's it's a cutoff. It's we're growing, we're kind of less not growing, not growing, and then it just drops off. And that's fine for the simulations that um, this model was used for, along with the logistic growth model. But it doesn't work when I'm really interested in what happens at really really low light conditions. So it's not working for those layers at the bottom for me. 
So I had to go back and um, redo these light surfaces to be really more correct on the edges here. So what I did, um, rather than refitting, well, I tried this, I refitted a lot of polynomial equations, none of which I was happy with. But I thought, well, what if we try to fit um, the traditional Platt equation to each of these slices and look the other way? Um, so Graham and Graham looked at um, a slice of a growth rate or a respiration rate versus temperature. I'm going to look at the growth rate versus light for each different temperature. And then I'm going to fit each of these three coefficients. So the Platt equation has three coefficients, a maximum term, so that um, determines the maximum rate that's re uh, reachable. And then it's got an alpha term that depends, or that mediates the slope of that curve at the beginning with that increasing limb, and a beta term that determines if there is or how strong the descending limb of this curve looks. So this is the, the general equation, and I'm going to fit this to each slice. So I looked at the growth experiments, all of them, so each one of these dots is an experiment that was conducted. It's a lot of work. Um, and I fitted that equation um, to each of them. And you note that I'm not giving as much weight to some of the um, experimental data. So similarly to Tomlinson and Al, et al., I'm, I'm recognizing that some of the experimental data seem to be outliers when I look at the surface in the end. But I'm developing curves that define each of these coefficients for each slice. And again, I looked at this the other way. I looked at growth versus light rather than growth versus temperature and took each of those. So then, once I've defined mu max, alpha, and beta for each slice, I'm going to look at what do those coefficients for each of those experiments um, look like. And, it turns, and can I graph that as a function of, temp, function of temperature? And I can. So now I can describe each of these coefficients as a function of temperature. And knowing that each coefficient is a function of temperature um, and plugging in I, I can normalize the, this equation and come up with a new surface. So I've come up with new surfaces um, for this, describing this F mu of IT that you saw at the beginning to attenuate the maximum growth rate. And that has smooth um, edges because I'm no longer using a polynomial that gets kind of funky around the edges. Now, I've done the same thing for respiration. Remember, total respiration is basal respiration plus light um, and plus light mediated, um, light enhanced respiration. And um, the basal respiration term I teased out from Graham's data by um, recognizing that, well, as shown before by Lorenz and colleagues and others, um, below about 29 uh, micro Einstein per meter squared per second, there's no um, growth happening. So th that's what basal respiration is. He's got two experiments at low light levels. So I teased those data, I pulled those data out and fitted um, an Arrhenius equation that's temperature dependent only to this um, term. So that's how we define our basal. Now the light enhanced respiration part of total respiration works the same way as the growth rate. I fitted those e um, equations to the I fitted those data with the Platt equation again, defining a maximum light enhanced respiration term, an alpha term, and a beta term for each slice. And then I looked, oh, is there a trend for each of those slices with respect to temperature? And lo and behold, there is. So I can define those coefficients as a function of temperature. And then again, um, normalize that equation and um, come up with a normalized respiration surface to define f of r i t. So having done all of this work, <laughs> I can now calculate net growth um, using those two, co two um, light attenuation coefficients for growth and respiration. Okay, so now having done all of this heavy uh, equation fitting, let's zoom back out and remember we were going to calculate growth rates in each slice. <laughs> um, so remembering that um, in a single layer we use logistic growth, now we're using a segmented canopy and calculating that growth rate using those new surfaces in each layer. And I'm using um, light extinction coefficients um, through the algo mat of 21.1 plus or minus 3.3 per meter. And those are based on measurements by Malkin and Higgins. So th I didn't pull these out of a hat. Um, and I put um, the, the shaded area here shows you the, the difference 
between using a really high and a really low coefficient. And what I'm really pleased about here is that it, while that's fairly large, it constrains my output to between a little over 200 and about 300 grams dry mass per meter squared without me having to tell it, oh, your maximum biomass is 250. Whereas before, I had to know what the maximum biomass is for the model to do what it needs to do. So this was really a more prescriptive way. It gave the modeler a lot of power or a lot of responsibility, I should say, in getting that X max term right. But now I don't have to know what X max is. I only have to know what the light extinction coefficient through the algal mat is, and that seems to be a lot more confined. So this is a huge success um, in my mind. We're no longer using X max, um, but we can do this um, through the layers. So here's an example of, um, of different mat heights or canopy heights, um, where I'm calculating the net growth rate in different layers. So I don't know if this is difficult to visualize, but this in theory is a 10 centimeter tall mat. So all of the cells are getting enough light to grow. So we've got a positive net growth here. Um, it's, yeah, so we've got the depth integrated mu net um, on top here in the bold black letters and the net growth rate range in each of these cells. So here's, here's a theoretical stand height of 20 centimeters. And if we go up to 50, you, you start, or even 40 here, you start seeing negative um, net growth rates in the bottom cells. So that brings this top number down and down and down and down, closer and closer to zero. So it has the same effect as um, the logistic growth model in that it brings, it forces growth down um, to zero so that that curve levels off. But again, I'm not doing that with X max, I'm doing it with light. Um, so this doesn't look very impressive compared to um, what Tomlinson um, published. So I used the same data to calibrate um, the third version of the Clodophora model, and I come out with virtually the same thing she did. So it doesn't look very impressive, but I think it's very impressive because I'm doing it in a different way. I don't have to tell it what the maximum biomass is. It's doing it on its own. So those results are great. And, um, and here's a visual of the algal bed height and how it changes over time. Um, it, it mimics biomass density. And um, here's a visual of the net growth rate. Um, I think I did the net growth rate at noon here. I don't think it's a net daily one, but I don't remember, I'm sorry. But the point here is that um, it changes over time at different um, po points in the mat. So the dotted line here is at the bottom of the mat, and you see it's at the beginning it's pretty good, but we've got lower biomass levels. And then later on in the season, when more sloughing happens, that net growth at the bottom of, of the mat is negative a lot. And then I've got a four centimeters from the bottom line and at the surface. They can grow at the surface pretty much whenever. Well, except at this point here. Um, right. Been a lot better than I thought I would, I think. <laughs> okay, so um, so what can we do with this? Well, uh, I framed the uh, the purpose of this modeling exercise um, with the Great Lakes Clodot or with the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, and we've got issues in like Ontario. Um, so our work focused primarily on the Ajax shore of Lake Ontario, but there's Clodafra in Lake Erie. There's Clodafra in um, in Lake Michigan, there are heaps of applications um, for this model to help set targets for um, nutrient management specific for Clodophora, which we haven't had in the past. So, um, right, so in these maps, I want to acknowledge were made by um, Colin Brooks at MTRI, and they're, I think, going to be released in the next month with updated maps. Um, so, the benefits here is that we can get coverage. So, we can know where Clodophora is based on satellite imagery but the satellite imagery isn't good enough to yet tell us what the biomass levels are. But in conjunction with a biomass model, um, this would be hugely informative. So that said, um, I hope I didn't put everybody to sleep, but um, a couple of highlights to take away from this is that the Clodophora resurgence coincides with the establishment of dry synods, so invasive mussels, and associated increases in water clarity. So mussels are filtering 
the water column, removing particulate and turbidity that allow light to penetrate deeper. And that in turn results in an increase in colonizable area and production potential. And, and this isn't news. This was foreseen in the 90s, um, maybe before. Um, we know that mechanistic models are used to predict cladophora growth and thus inform water quality managers. Um, they're important tools, and it's important to get these things as, as correct, as right as possible, because management is expensive if we make wrong predictions. So if we've got terms like X max that are so, I don't want to say arbitrary, but really tough to calibrate and get right, what can we do um, to reduce coefficients um, like that? To get rid of them. So historically those models uh, were simulated uh, using a single layer that required a carrying capacity term, the logistic growth model, and they're highly sensitive to that X max coefficient. In this third version of the Clodophora model, and this is only one upgrade that I focused on right now, we also worked on a couple of other things including uptake and um, the sloughing algorithm, um, but here we're using a segmented layer algorithm that accounts for light attenuation through the algal mat, so looking at what happens to the cells in each of, of the layers. I didn't mention either, we're splitting them up into a single um, centimeter each. And we're eliminating Xmax this way and using Kalg, so we are introducing a new coefficient, but this one is based on data um, that still give us a much tighter um, result. Um, in terms of the actual maximum attainable biomass than having to impose that maximum. Um, so it's based on measurements. And the approach is much more mechanistic than that log logistic growth model. To achieve that though, um, remember that I had to also come up with new light and temperature response curves based on the same data sets that were used before. I didn't have funding to redo all of these experiments, um, but I did uh, fit new response curves to more accurate accurately attenuate gross growth and respiration rates at low light levels. All right, I think I'm doing all right. And I wanna thank you all for your attention, those who managed to stay awake, and I'll take any questions. Yeah? Uh, a, a question on, on this, the uh, water quality people who somehow like to control yeah, that's a really good question. And I think in all of this, as much as I focused on light, yeah, it comes back down to phosphorus. Phosphorus is the only thing we can manage. We're not going to change light conditions. We're not going to dredge the lakes to remove all the muscles that have changed light conditions. Um, we're not going to change the substrate um, or the temperature single, well, we are changing the temperature inadvertently. But yes, phosphorus remains the management variable. So in, in terms of the model, where does that come in? It's, it comes in through droop, through that F of Q term. So um, internal phosphorus concentrations become limiting or supporting growth. So to limit internal phosphorus, we have to limit external phosphorus, right? So total phosphorus, soluble phosphorus, you know, there's there's lots of talk about um, particulate phosphorus and muscles producing, I, I don't like to use the word producing, but cycling phosphorus, so turning particulate unavailable phosphorus into soluble bioavailable phosphorus. And yes, um, people have shown that that's happening um, and that makes the system more sensitive. So yes, we need to include the muscle um, transformations of phosphorus that then produce bioavailable phosphorus, which in turn changes internal phosphorus levels in, in, the, in the Clodophora. And I, um, in, in this third version of the Clodophora model, I looked at uptake rates and how sensitive they are. So I performed more experiments to try and better define the uptake rate. And this is, this is pretty difficult. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, uptake rates change with respect to the internal storage of, of cladophora or internal phosphorus storage of cladophora and external levels of phosphorus. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but it was around what do we do about phosphorus. So yeah, we have to manage phosphorus to manage cladophora, but to what level? And why am I worrying about light? Well, if I can do all kinds of things with a model, right? If I know what X max I want, um, but it needs to be as mechanistic as possible and as simple as possible, right? So.
I don't know if I answered your question there. Th those were a lot of thoughts in one. <laughs> So you see uh, in these, uh, the people who have samples being put out there, are there big changes in phosphorus scores with, with time? With, oh yes. Um, so in the same paper, I don't have this graph here now, but in the same um, paper, so the Clodafra resurgence paper uh, from 2016, I looked at biomass and, um, which one do I want to look at? biomass and stored phosphorus levels, and you can see the same trend of TP and biomass levels. So we have huge amounts of biomass in the pre-P management and somewhat less biomass levels in the post-P management period, and standing crop goes down even further now. So they're not growing denser or faster. We don't, per square meter, see more clodophora necessarily everywhere. But over all of that area that they cover, if you clip all of that off and put it on a pile on the beach, it's the same amount or more as what we see um, before. Now, I looked at the same data um, for our stored phosphorus, and it's, it's the same story. They, on average, on average, <laughs> seem to be more phosphorus limited than they used to be. But that doesn't mean we never see high stored phosphorus levels. Um, we were working around the Ajax shore here and covered a shoreline area or length of I think about 20 kilometers and I took Clodophora samples along a five meter depth 30 or 300 meters apart it was 60 something samples along the shore um, and, and analyzed those samples for stored phosphorus and I saw huge differences I saw really starved algae and I saw really full algae and the full algae we're in the hot spots of where the point sources were. So where the really the really buff ones are is where the phosphorus is coming from. So yes, um, I see an on average a temporal trend of um, lower stored phosphorus Q values, but that doesn't mean we don't see high values on, at hot spots. So treatment plant um, outfalls that go, discharge straight into Clodophora habitat result in what we saw here very dense Clodophora. Um, so this is near a treatment plant outfall. But um, the densest here, yeah. Okay, I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah? So it's interesting that you mentioned in the investing you were trying to work on improving the sloughing term. Um, mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah, you're getting exactly at it. So um, in the second version of the Clodophora model, Tomlinson um, focuses or uses a sloughing term that's entirely driven by temperature. Um, but I'm in, in the third version, I'm splitting it apart, and I, it's not perfect yet, but I'm recognizing that there are two things. There's a physical way they detach driven by current temperature, and then there's this biological way or well, light attenuation, they become really weak at the bottom and then detach that way. So yes, I take, I use two factors in that sloughing algorithm, which I, I'm not gonna go into now further, but yeah, it's part of the third version of the Clodophora model as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah? When you did your new response curve, you estimated, I think it was an alpha and a beta, yeah. at each temperature slice, yeah. and then estimated the temperature function, Yes, um, right. Yeah, exactly. So this was, this is hard to explain, and I spent so much time time trying to do this right. But I, um, yeah, so this is the, the measured growth rate versus light. So each one of these is an experimental um, result at the specific temperature. You got this one, yeah. So for each of these, I got an alpha, right? And then I wanted to see if I ca if I plot this alpha as a function of this p, is there a trend? And if I do that for each of those, um, alpha, beta, and mu max, and oh wait, it, it follows another trend. So now I'm I can plot this as a function of time, oh temperature. Sorry. Right, I, my, my suggestion is you should do them all 
set up a series of equations, mm -hmm. the estimation of alpha, beta, and that temperature function, all of the same time. So do a 2D estimate. Uh, yeah, it's not, you've got alpha, beta, and your alpha and your beta, by virtue of the structure of the equation you have, are going to be extremely highly correlated. Mm -hmm. And that means that their individual estimates aren't going to be terribly stable. Mm -hmm. If you do them all simultaneously, you're likely to improve that temperature relationship. Okay. Because that will place a constraint on how far alpha and beta can move relatively. Okay. That's not that hard to program. Okay. So a, when, when they were doing polynomials, that was all you could do. That yeah. Was all you could do. That was the software. Right. When current software, mm -hmm. you could program it so that you could fit all of these coefficients at the same time and probably mm -hmm. do better. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll get back to you about that. That's that's a good thought. <laughs> well, you just made a suggestion. Now I'm going to want to see it. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Mark. Um, you talked about how in the previous version of the model, uh, determining that x max, you calibrate it for a specific site, but it would to other sites. So in the new version of the model, how does that X max or maximum biomass vary by site? What kind of variables go into determining that? Yeah. Um, okay. So I only showed the result for um, like Michigan here and compared, well, I didn't actually pull out the comparison because it looks the same roughly um, for um, what Tomlinson did. But I did apply this to um, all four of the Great Lakes where we see nuisance Clodophora. And yes, I had to adjust the k out coefficient, but only within that range of measurements. Um, so there still is some calibration, but but it's not like what I had to come up with before, an actual um, x max that's more or less arbitrary. I don't know if that answers your question, but I have applied it across different lakes. So now the x max would be a function of the phosphorus concentration. Oh right. It's solely yeah, it's it's not temperature. It's it's still a function of the same things as before, but not a function of a prescribed X max. So right, it still has light temperature, stored phosphorus, and the calibration factor K alg. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mark's question was how how is how does X max change across sites now that I'm modeling this differently? So um, X max is no longer prescribed, but the maximum biomass that I now simulate is a function of the same things as before, like temperature and nutrients, um, but no longer includes that f of X term. Yeah. Mhm. Mm how does Got a model now where you attenuate light through the clodophora mm -hmm. so My question is, if you were to eliminate the whole strand of clodophora equally, would the cells near the base go in the same way as the cells in the terminal portion? Or yeah, that's how I'm modeling it. So clearly this isn't perfect, but yeah, in my model, um, the cells here in the 10 centimeter mat are growing just the same as the top 10 centimeters of a really thick mat. Given that they have the same Yeah, yeah. Um, now you can, I'm not going to sabotage myself here, but maybe I am. <laughs> what happens <laughs> if uh, the mat doesn't always stand up perfectly and I'm waving this way and oh gosh, suddenly the cell's over here. But it's, it, it's a net mat, a net um, mat height that I'm modeling here. And it was it was actually really tough looking at this. Um, so Kyle Flynn did some work in rivers and also looked at light attenuation coefficients um, through clodophora mats and rivers. And it and he came up with much higher coefficients than um, Sarah Malkin and Scott Higgins did. And I was wondering, how is that possible? Well, in rivers, those strands get compacted and really um, mushed together really uh, really tightly. So it makes sense that those coefficients are much higher than what we're seeing in a lake where it's a little bit more fluid and there is more, more room in these strands. So um, 
yeah, taking this to rivers and, and different species too. I'm thinking about this a lot in New Zealand because it's not all Clodophora there. We've got Didymo, we've got Firmidium microcolius. Um, it's, it's a lot different. So light extinction coefficients through different kinds of algae would have to be measured as well. Any more questions? We can talk a little bit about New Zealand um, with these rivers. Um, <laughs> right, so I mentioned Formidium or Microcoleus. It's a, it's a cyanobacterium um, that produces anatoxins, neural toxins um, that are especially bad for dogs. So over 100 dog deaths have been recorded that are directly linked to um, these toxin-producing bacteria in, in the rivers in New Zealand. And obviously that's a health concern if the dogs are dying. Um, and the interesting thing is these mats there seem to trap sediment that could be rich in phosphorus and then um, extract phosphorus from those mats as well. So I don't know how to incorporate that here um, in a model like this, but that's another thing to look at. And then, um, we're doing a lot of work monitoring different algal species based on um, imagery, so putting up cameras to get time series and rivers, um, and and also use drone imagery to monitor um, algae algae over space. There, um, what's challenging, what's really interesting in New Zealand is they have something sort of similar to the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, no Great Lakes, but a national policy statement for freshwater management, and they've actually set biomass targets. So here, I brought this up. We, we're you know, all about uh, keeping biomass levels uh, below those constituting nuisance conditions, right? Um, where do I have this slide? But we don't really know how to do that um, because we don't have biomass targets. In New Zealand, they've set biomass targets. So they've got four bands, class A, B, C, D, and they say a maximum of 200 milligrams um, of chlorophyll per square meter is what's considered acceptable for periphyton attached algae. But the only way they decide whether a river exceeds or falls within a certain band is by sending somebody out physically to take samples. So somebody goes out and scrubs the rocks, scrubs 10 rocks over a 10 meter reach of river and gets an integrated biomass estimate once a month. So they have 12 samples for a river, for a part of a river reach that represents the whole river, and one of those samples is allowed to exceed that 200, and then it's deemed okay. It's, a, it's above the, or below the acceptable um, biomass level. But how exact is that? Hmm, it's, it's tough. So that's where this imagery work that I'm doing there is coming in to try and get better spatial and temporal coverage using imagery. I've done a lot of ground truthing to try and calibrate those algorithms, um, and it's, it's still a work in progress, but you might think, why is she doing all this imagery work over there? Well, I am hopeful for the imagery work to serve um, as calibration data because I can do a lot of modeling um, and I can do a lot of calibrating, but if my confidence in these few data points is low because they're spot samples, then what's my model worth? So I'm hoping that with imagery-based monitoring, we can get better data sets that will help us calibrate and, and validate mechanistic models like this. Yeah. All right. Well, if there are any more questions, we can thank Donna Fabian. Thank you, guys.